Well, good morning, everybody, and, uh, and welcome to the inaugural uh, Green Ribbon Commission Climate Action Change event, what we're referring to as GRCX. Uh, we're putting this series on because the feedback we get from our members and network uh, participants is that the thing, one of the things they value the most about the GRC experience is the opportunity for best practice exchange. So we're going to be doing a series of these somewhere between one to two a month. Um, over the next um, year, really focused on actionable information, deep dive on issues that seem to be really relevant to accelerating the implementation of the city's climate action plan. Today, as you know, is on uh, geothermal, uh, electrifying heating and cooling. Uh, we have our next session is scheduled for September 16th, um, which is going to be focused on the work that the GRC has been doing with Arcadis, a deep dive into the seaport with uh, really concrete recommendations about how to build long-term resilience, governance, and finance structures so that the city can actually undertake the projects it needs to take. We're, we're also planning on late September uh, doing an event with uh, Delta Terra Capital on the relationship between climate risk and real estate uh, markets, both in terms of real estate investors and in terms of municipal finance. And we're working on a series of other events in the fall on strategic energy master plans, hydrogen, district energy, and a couple of other issues. So if you've uh, got an invite to this and you're here, uh, you will get an invite um, to, 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 all of, to all of those. Uh, next slide. So I'm going to first, uh, oh, I should introduce myself. I'm John Cleveland with the Boston Green Ribbon Commission and along with my colleague, uh, Amy Longsworth, uh, we staff the, staff the GRC. So I'm gonna start with a short kind of intro background on carbon-free Boston and the cap update and how the geothermal strategy kind of fits into that. I will then do introduction of our three speakers. They will each speak for 15 minutes. Um, with two of them focused on two geothermal case studies. Um, and then we'll have probably at least a half hour for questions at the end. So as Claire indicated, as, as the speakers do their presentations and you have questions you would like answered, um, put them into the chat box because I will take the questions um, off of the chat box uh, and uh, we'll cover as many of them as we can in the, in the time that we have. Uh, next slide, Claire. Um, most of you are familiar with the Carbon Free Boston report, which was a summary report, a report on social equity, and then deep dive reports on each of the key um, emissions sectors. Next slide. We're constantly reminded about how important buildings are in a carbon neutrality strategy in dense cities like Boston. It's not uncommon for them to have this high a percentage of the um, emissions in the city and uh, decarbonizing the built environment will require both retrofitting existing buildings and making sure that all new buildings are zero net carbon. Next slide. About 85% of the buildings we're gonna have in 2050 are existing buildings, but between now and then 15% uh, of them um, will be new buildings. So it's really critical that we get that right at the front end because any of those buildings, we don't build the ZNC standards We'll have to get retrofitted sometime in the next 15 years. So these two buildings are examples of sort of commercial industrial um, uh, structures that have in fact um, uh, gotten to um, a, a ZNC design at the front end. Next slide. Uh, four activities that are really needed to get us successfully to there. Again, you're all pretty familiar with these. Reducing demand, electrification, uh, greenhouse gas free renewables and good design on, uh, <clears throat> on social equity outcomes. The, the geothermal strategy is in that second, uh, second area, which is a version of electrification. Next slide. That carbon free Boston report was taken by the city and used to help inform the 2019 climate action plan update. Next slide. There are a series of strategies related to the building sector. 
Um, several of them are sort of the city kind of being an applied R&D environment for this and, and leading by example by mandating all their buildings to be zero net carbon, uh, zero net carbon for any affordable housing that they finance, um, a very aggressive strategy on retrofitting of the existing municipal buildings and, and work on workforce development programs. Also coming down the pike are uh, three kinds of policy mandates to which the city controls, one of which it doesn't. Um, uh, one is a building emissions performance standard for existing large building, which is an, it would be an evolution of Birdo. Uh, the second is a zero net carbon zoning for new construction, which would be administered by the BPDA as part of its Article 80 process. And then third, really pushing the state to change the building code that will, um, will give cities the option of having a ZNC stretch code. Next slide. Um, some of you may have participated in an event that ABC put on, a report that uh, was done by Cadmus as part of the GRC uh, Commercial Real Estate Working Group. It took another sort of deep dive into thermal electrification for, um, for uh, CNI buildings, looked at the core technologies of air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, which is what we're talking about today, and, uh, and variable refrigerant flow uh, heat pumps. So this sort of got down at the Lex level of detail and it had five case studies in it, one of which was, um, one of which was the BU building. So this will give us an opportunity to dive more deeply into two of the case studies and talk about what does it take to do, what are the challenges of doing geothermal in a dense urban environment? Next slide. So um, my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Uh, Dennis Carlberg, who's the Associate Vice President of Sustainability for Boston University, and it's pretty well known to most of you. Uh, he leads the Boston University Climate Action Planning process and really helped drive the plan that created the context for BU's geothermal strategy, which in turn uh, motiv motivated them to develop this new building um, using geothermal. So Dennis is going to talk a little bit about the structure of that plan and that, how that sort of created the context um, uh, for this particular project. Um, uh, Jacob is the Director of Sustainable Design at BR Plus A, and he leads the firm's sustainability consulting team. Uh, he's worked and been a champion on over 2 million square feet of net zero projects and has won multiple awards um, in the process. He's also a board member of the Boston Society for Architecture, and uh, they were the lead on uh, the BU uh, geothermal project. Kate is the Director of Sustainability and Building Performance at Arrow Street, an architecture and design firm in Boston. She directs their strategic building performance plan and is a national leader in net zero, embodied carbon, integrated design, material evaluation, and occupant um, engagement. She played the lead role in the second case study, which is the King Open Cambridge Street Upper School and Community Complex um, case study. And it's a, a net zero emissions public school in Cambridge, um, first designed net zero emissions school in Massachusetts. So it'd be great to be able to dive um, into that project in particular. Again, uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to Dennis, just a reminder, as you have questions, um, please put your questions in the chat box. Um, Dennis, I'll turn it over to you now. Thanks. Thank you, John. Um, I'll share my screen uh, as soon as I have sharing permissions. Okay. Okay, can everybody see my screen okay? Yep, looks like Great. it's looking good. Thank you, John. Um, I just wanna start by uh, saying how exciting, <laughs> exciting this is uh, to be part of the first GRCX um, event. Um, I think Amy and John have done a great job with uh, Slow and McManus putting us all together. Uh, so thank you for doing all that great work. Um, so, uh, let me just get started. Uh, I, I guess I'd like to uh, lay out the reasons uh, why the Center for Computing and Data Sciences uh, is leading the decarbonization transformation at Boston University and put that in the context of uh, our climate action plan, uh, which was approved by the Board of Trustees uh, two and a half years ago. 
two and a half years ago. Um, let me minimize this. Um, so there were five high level uh, goals uh, set forth in the climate action plan. I'm really only going to talk about the first three, focus mostly on the second one. So preparing the campuses for the impacts from climate change that can no longer be avoided, getting to net zero direct emissions by 2040, and acting on indirect emissions. Uh, so essentially, as it relates to the Center um, for Computing and Data Sciences, um, how we address um, embodied carbon. So uh, just a brief timeline, the, the, the two major projects that are resulting from the Climate Action Plan, these started uh, before we did the Climate Action Plan. BU Wind, uh, which is a uh, renewable energy project for the university, and then the Center for, Center for Computing and Data Sciences, which is our first fossil fuel free carbon free building currently under construction. Uh, we developed the Climate Action Plan and late started in late uh, 2016 and through 2017. It was approved by the Board of Trustees in December of 2017. While we were going through that process, we brought the same team along uh, in, who helped us uh, in procuring a renewable energy project. We wanted to understand what the economics of the renewable energy project would be before going to the Board of Trustees. The project is now under construction. And by the end of this year, uh, we will be getting 100% uh, of our electricity demand met by uh, the BU Wind project. The Center for Computing and Data Sciences came back out of the drawer in 2018 with a mandate to be fossil fuel free. That wouldn't have happened without the cap uh, and carbon free, obviously. Uh, the wells have been drilled. Uh, that drilling was underway while the project was finishing its uh, GMP uh, production of the documents. Uh, we had the hiatus for COVID and now the project is back under construction and um, on track. Um, the, the center, um, or the climate action, in the context of the climate action plan, um, this is an important building. Frankly, I think it is, um, it is, it is setting the standard for Boston University, plain and simple. Um, I want to go through the sort of the six reasons I feel uh, this project is uh, BU's most sustainable yet. Uh, and in my view, um, really at the moment, the most transformative building in Boston. That's a big, big thing to say, but uh, I really feel it's it's showing how we can get fossil fuel free, carbon free done at a scale. The project is uh, 345,000 square feet, 19 stories. Uh, so it's a significant project in the skyline of Boston University. Um, and it, it will be a critical in, in, uh, in the fact that as John mentioned, the building sector is, is a significant portion of the city of Boston's uh, greenhouse gas emissions, it's about two thirds of, of all of the emissions in Boston. So we need to address the building sector uh, as aggressively as we possibly can. Um, so reason number one, uh, resilient design. Uh, in our climate action plan, we set an elevation of resilience uh, for flooding at um, Boston City Base 20 feet, which is two feet above the Charles River Dam elevation. Um, that elevation of resilience uh, was established for both campuses and this building is 1.25 feet above that elevation of resilience for its first floor elevation. Uh, reason number two, and I, I promise not to show a lot of graphs, but frankly graphs are an important way of, the, of uh, how, we, how we think about this work. Um, but getting to net zero direct emissions, uh, this is our greenhouse gas abatement curve with emissions on the left uh, years uh, on the on the x-axis. The gray are all of our fossil fuel emissions for building operations and uh, the other colors represent how we're going to achieve net zero direct emissions by 2040. We will reduce demand by 31% uh, by 2032. We'll shift from fossil fuel use to electricity for heating and cooling to enable renewable energy. We'll source renewable energy to match 100% of the university's electricity demand. 
and we will begin the transition of BU's fleet to electric vehicles. Energy efficiency begins uh, with the building envelope. And uh, this building is designed with sunshades uh, on the exterior to keep the sun's heat out in the summertime and triple glazed to keep the heat, heat in in the wintertime. Uh, maximizing energy efficiency through building systems is critical. Uh, next step, and uh, this project employs 31 1,500 foot deep wells uh, using the Earth's thermal mass uh, to heat to store the heat in heat from the summer and pull that heat back out in the winter time. So those wells um, are 1,500 foot deep, which, oops, which are essentially twice the height of the John Hancock building. Uh, the center is designed with an enhanced HVAC system using water to conduct thermal energy through the building because it has a much greater capacity to conduct heat and cooling. Uh, fresh air is provided over those chilled beams um, it, but it requires le much less volume and is much more controllable. Jacob will talk a lot more about that in a minute. Um, so this is my favorite graph, I'll just tell you right from the beginning. Uh, if we were to build this building to meet Massachusetts uh, energy code, we would still be emitting nearly 1.4 million kilograms of CO2 annually. This building is about 30% more efficient than uh, a co-compliant building in Boston. Um, using the ma thermal mass of the earth, as I described, uh, we will be able to go to, fo to fossil fuel free. There will be no gas line connected to this building. Let me repeat that. There'll be no gas line connected to this building. So this is all electric, uh, 345,000 square feet of it. Um, by going electric, that enables us to source the energy from renewable resources. So we will be sourcing the energy from, or matching uh, our load for this building from BU Wind out in South Dakota. That allows us to be fossil fuel free and carbon free. Um, and that I think is the coolest bar on the chart. Uh, so geothermal wells have been dug. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, there are 31, uh, there are 31 of them, 1500 feet deep. Um, and, uh, we're well on our way in construction. Uh, we will be sourcing um, electricity from the, U the grid in New England. However, we will be matching that electricity demand with BU Wind, which is located in South Dakota. Let me just play a, a short video here. The height of the wind turbines is 500 feet. Uh, rotor diameter is 380 feet. 100% of the wind turbine components and electrical components have been delivered to the site. Uh, the sweep area of the wind turbines, which I think is interesting, is 2.6 acres per wind turbine. And there are 92 wind turbines in total. 99% of the foundations have been completed. 75% of the wind turbines are stacked. This project is on track to generate electricity for Boston University by the end of this year. As I mentioned, this project will match 100% of the university's electricity demand, which will be, it will generate 205 million kilowatt hours of electricity per BU each year. So back to Boston. Uh, reason number three, uh, indoor environmental quality. A great deal of effort has gone into designing this building with interlocking spaces, plenty of access to daylight and views, and uh, materials that uh, are much more healthy than one find, often finds in buildings. Reason number four, uh, outdoor environmental quality. The green roofs step up around the building 
uh, providing access to outdoor spaces on seven levels of the building. Obviously, this also helps uh, reduce the urban heat island effect and stores rainwater. Um, reason number five, embodied carbon. Uh, embodied carbon in building structure, superstructure, and building envelope is responsible for 28% of building emissions, buildings, global building sector emissions. Uh, in, in order to determine the amount of embodied carbon in the building, we've done a life cycle assessment. And based on that life cycle assessment, uh, have specified products and procedures, uh, particularly in the concrete, uh, to reduce the embodied carbon uh, in this project. Climate leadership. Uh, this is the first building at BU where we are seeking LEED Platinum. Uh, as you know, LEED, LEED certification isn't done until the building is complete, so we don't really know if we'll make it to Platinum, uh, but I think as you can see from this chart, we're tracking pretty well into the Platinum range. Let me just say a few words about BU's leadership. Um, because frankly, this makes me pretty proud of the organization I'm a part of. Um, with, with this, uh, at the groundbreaking uh, for the Center for Computing and Data Sciences, Mayor Walsh talked about Boston University as a climate leader. He talked about the center as a hallmark of climate leadership. He sees the center as a leading example of sustainable design and an important solution for helping the city meet its goal in its climate action plan to be carbon free by 2050. A week after the groundbreaking, Mayor Walsh signed an executive order that all new municipal buildings will be carbon free. We are extremely fortunate to be a part of a city with such great climate leadership. I have to say, I'm very proud of the bold steps BU is taking to meet its commitments in its climate action plan. And I'm uh, very proud of uh, the way the city is, is moving forward in its climate leadership as well. So with that, let me uh, give back my share, unshare. Hey, Dennis, while you transition over to Jacob, I just want to let all the participants know, because we've got a, questions on it, we will be sending out a link to all these presentations. So just want you to know that. Thanks, John. Dennis, so Jacob, it's all yours. An inspiring overview of how we ended up where we are. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the more technical details of the engineering and the systems to give people a better sense of how this is actually implemented. So this diagram you see on the screen now uh, is a summary of the mechanical systems for the building. You can see at the top, we have the dedicated outdoor air, air handlers. Those then provide just the right amount of ventilation to all of the zones throughout the building. And those zones are then heated and cooled by systems that use water to move that energy around the building instead of you know, using more air. It's a much more efficient way to transfer thermal energy. So we're using chilled beams and fan cooling units. And as Dennis mentioned, this building is all electric. So you can see even for our backup system, it's an electric boiler, no gas. But the, the main heating and cooling systems are uh, heat pump scroll chillers that connect to the geothermal bore field. And then to supplement those for cooling, which has a higher peak demand, we have our water cooled centrifugal chillers. And of course, all of this is relying on the high performance envelope. So to give you an idea of what's happening at the floor level, this is one of the, the levels of the tower. Uh, those green bars you see around the perimeter and in some of the interior zones, those are the chilled beams. But the, the problem with a typical chilled beam design is that those chilled beams, the only way to get them to provide heating and cooling is to blow air through them. And that typically comes from the dedicated outdoor air, air handler. So anytime you want to heat or cool a zone, you have to bring in outdoor air and blow it through those chilled beams. And so even if a zone is unoccupied, let's say people leave the space in the afternoon, there's nobody there, your system is still going to be blowing ventilation air through those spaces and there's really no need when there's nobody in the space. So what we did was we added fan powered boxes that can decouple the 
dedicated outdoor air ventilation from the conditioning of the space. And so these fan powered boxes, you can see there's only about, I think seven of them on this floor. So it's not a lot of added equipment or maintenance, but those can then blow the air through the chilled beams. They also bring the ventilation from the air handler to the chilled beams. So they're, they're essentially uh, achieving both of those goals, but the air handler can turn off or turn down when the ventilation isn't needed. And these fan powered boxes can continue to blow air through the chilled beams uh, to keep the space comfortable and uh, you know, within temperature control range. One of the big advantages of this approach between the, the fan powered boxes and the chilled beams and also in the large classroom spaces we have fan coil units is the space savings. So this allowed us to reduce the size of the air handlers, reduce the size of the shafts and uh, make a more efficient layout for the building. This building has a relatively narrow uh, and small floor plate. And so all of those square feet really added up to value for BU and, and actually construction cost savings. So here's a little bit more about the uh, geothermal itself. The um, typical geothermal is only 500 feet deep. As Dennis mentioned, this is 1,500 feet deep, so three times as deep. And so a typical U-bend uh, high-density polyethylene pipe would not work for this application. It also would be pretty inefficient because you, you can imagine uh, a pipe going down right next to a pipe coming back up. Uh, if they're made of the same material, you're going to be basically transferring heat between those two pipes and losing some of the benefit of what you're trying to get out of the ground in terms of thermal energy. Now I should mention this is all a closed loop system. There's no actual water exchange with the ground. It's all sealed. But what we're doing instead of a typical U-bend is we're using uh, HPGX, high performance geo exchange. And it's a pipe within a pipe. Now you might say, well, wait a minute. I thought you just said two pipes next to each other was bad because of all that heat loss between the two pipes. But how could a pipe within a pipe be any better? Well, the, the creative solution here is that the inner pipe is an insulated pipe and the outer pipe is very conductive and connects with the rock. And so that inner pipe is an EPDM and uh, the water goes down with as, as little heat transfer as possible. And then it gets to the bottom of that inner pipe, it releases into the outer pipe and then it comes back up within the, the annulus between the two pipes. And that outer pipe is a composite, a thin composite, very strong material that can handle the high pressures of those very deep boreholes and also get good heat exchange with the ground. So this is a, a great solution for particularly for first sites where you need to get as much out of the ground as possible in a small area and go deep. In terms of how the geothermal system operates, uh, we're not uh, people typically think of the ground as, as a stable temperature. And generally that is true when you leave it undisturbed. But as soon as you put in a geothermal bore field and you start rejecting heat into the ground all summer long and then pulling heat back out of the ground all winter long, you are actually pushing the ground temperature up throughout the summer and then dragging it back down throughout the winter. That's one of the arts of this whole process is you're actually using the ground as a giant thermal storage battery. And you actually intentionally reject heat into the ground in the summer so that you warm up that huge mass of, of bedrock. And that becomes your heating thermal resource through the winter. And getting that balance right is, is part of the whole process of designing the system and setting up the controls. So in summertime, you can see here in the diagram, uh, with that purple color, we're basically rejecting heat into the ground. We're warming it up. We might be sending water down at 85 degrees. It comes back at 75. And then we're able to use a heat pump that's electrically driven, basically a chiller, to, to pull that heat out of that loop, uh, excuse me, reject heat into that loop and cool the building. And then in wintertime, all we do is reverse the process. And those heat pump chillers are now rejecting heat into the building and pulling it out of the ground. And we have to manage, of course, all those temperatures to keep the water from freezing, uh, particularly because you cannot put glycol into a borehole that's not fully grouted and you cannot physically fully grout a 1500 foot deep borehole. So it is just water in that, that ground loop. This is the bore field layout. We have 31 boreholes. You can see in the bottom left is the footprint of the building. Uh, through the center horizontally of this screen, you can see is the alleyway 
and on the top left is the corner park along Granby Street. And so we're able to fit uh, 28 of the boreholes out within that park and alleyway. But I ended up uh, four of the boreholes are underneath the footprint of the building, which adds some cost and complexity to the construction process. So you wanna typically minimize the number of boreholes under the building, although there are a number of buildings built that put all of the boreholes under the building if you have no uh, other site area available. So I'll just talk very briefly about the process of installing the borehole. So you can see a bunch of equipment out here. It's a little hard to see what's going on, but I can zoom in here and show you. Here is the drill rig. That's drilling those 1500 foot deep boreholes. Here is when they switch out that truck for a different truck that helps them lower into the borehole the sections of pipe of the of the actual uh, tubing itself that the water will flow through. These are the frack tanks. So these are, when you drill those boreholes, there's a lot of water that comes up out of the borehole and it's full of mud and silt and, and all kinds of things. So you want to allow that storm wa water to go into the storm system, but you can't dump all that silt down the storm system. So you have to have a way to, to let that settle out. And then you take that sediment out and you need, they were using a, dry trucks to ultimately ship it off site. So they needed to mix it with more earth to be able to make it solid enough to put into the trucks to, to haul it away. So this is the sedimentation uh, fields out on the, on the site. And I have to say, I love this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> These pipes are fiberglass, it's not that heavy. Um, so one of the big questions that comes up is what did this all cost? And we did a very detailed analysis because uh, the, there's a number of uh, hurdles one has to go through and approvals of a, of a large project like this on BU's campus. As with any major campus, there's a, there's a review process and making sure that the investment is the appropriate investment for the college. And so we did a detailed analysis of what is the actual construction cost premium to design and build this building. And you can see on the left, a conventional building, there would actually be a lot more costs in more conventional mechanical systems and also larger space required, as I mentioned earlier, to house those larger mechanical systems. And so through all of that efficient design on our systems, we were able to recoup millions of dollars relative to a conventional building. And that then is what funded the installation of the geothermal bore field. And that net difference between those two ended up being less than 1% of construction cost. And there are a number of studies that have looked at what is the cost of achieving net zero. Uh, one of them, most recent and relevant here, is the USGBC's report, now Built Environment Plus, uh, they're called, uh, the zero energy buildings in Massachusetts saving money from the start, making the point that it's, it's not necessarily just about payback, but actually we're finding examples where we're getting to smaller and smaller premiums to achieve net zero, even using strategies like geothermal. All right, Kate, now on to you. You're on mute, by the way. Can you hear me? You're yeah. good. Okay, great. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about this project in Cambridge, the King Open Cambridge Street Upper School and Community Complex. Uh, hold on a second. There we go. Um, so this particular project uh, had uh, many goals. Here are the sort of top four goals 
Uh, one is that it needed to be in a, commu a community amenity um, for Cambridge and also especially for the East uh, Cambridge area that you know, really hadn't had any new civic development um, in a very long time. Equity and inclusion um, were two key components to both schools, um, entities that are in this building. Uh, those are core mission statements for those schools, for the King Open and for the Cambridge Street Upper School. And also they wanted it to be broader than just their schools and their missions, but to the community at large and how can it be inclusive and equitable for that community that it serves. A healthy environment um, was really about the building itself um, for the occupants, for the site around it, and then dramatically increasing the amount of open space and green space, but also looking at the more global picture of emissions um, into the larger environment. And the building houses um, multiple schools, and so it is learning centered from that aspect, but it also has a public library, and they wanted to make sure that you know, learning um, became something that was just not in the classroom, but also outward um, to the community and also from the community back um, into the schools as well. So some of the metrics that we use to meet those goals, um, net zero emissions, uh, lead before platinum, which we will hopefully be getting that certification very soon. We're just waiting for our last review. Um, using rainwater um, collection to reduce the amount of um, potable water use dramatically in the building. And then um, in terms of the indoor environment, red list free materials was a key component of the interior finishes and the furniture. This project uh, really is a pilot project for the Net Zero Cambridge um, plan. That policy went uh, into effect in 2015 in Cambridge uh, and outlined a 25-year um, plan for all buildings, both private and public, to get to net zero emissions um, in that span. And the first milestone in that plan was for 2020 for the um, city-owned buildings to start meeting net zero emissions. And this project was going to open in 2019. Um, we started working on the project in 2014, and so they wanted to use this project um, to understand how they could meet this new policy um, and really lead by example by this building um, opening in 2019. And so the key components of this plan for buildings uh, is that there's no combustion, so there's no fossil fuel combustion, and that the all building systems are all electric. A little overview about the project. Um, it's 930 students. Um, there are three different schools in here. There's a preschool, um, which is very small, so it's not um, labeled on this diagram. And then there's two large schools, uh, an elementary school, which is King Open, and then an upper um, school uh, or middle school, which is Cambridge Street. And um, those are the key um, school components, and there's also an after-school program that has some dedicated space in the building as well. Um, there are other pieces here um, besides the school. There's a public uh, branch library and the um, district administration for the whole citywide school district is also located in the building. And there's also an outdoor pool which has some um, interior components um, to it and there is an underground parking garage. Uh, the building is about 273,000 square feet. Um, the highest portions are four stories, so the orange and light orange colors you see there are four stories um, and then the uh, west, or sorry, the east side of the site, um, the blue areas go up to three stories. Um, and the project is designed to be at um, uh, EUI of 25, and it opened just about a year ago. This is just some uh, images of what the building looks like um, just after completion. Um, so you can see there's a four story portion, um, which is on the west part of the site, and the um, three-story portion on the east side, and they are connected. It's all one building, and it's connected by ground floor connectors um, in the middle. Uh, again, part of the um, civic amenity and the community aspect of this building was really inviting people into the site um, and uh, creating a civic courtyard along Cambridge Street, and then really addressing all aspects of the building. So it's a four-sided building um, where there are um, outdoor spaces and courtyards um, where it can be used by the school during the school day and then the public um, after hours and weekends all year long. This is just a view um, looking north from the back of the site. Um, and the site ends really at the edge where you see the splash pad playground and uh, basketball court. The Donnelly Fields portion, which is south of that, is a state um, chapter 97 open space, um, is not part of this particular project. 
Um, and again, this was just after completion last year, so the pool wasn't quite finished, but it's about to open. Here are just some more images um, from that civic courtyard off of Cambridge Street. You can see the two um, wings of the building and the um, glass connector that connects on the ground floor. And um, the community complex, that is really the welcoming space um, for the community to come in. Um, they, in Cambridge, have a great program of being able to have community groups um, access, uh, you know, the auditorium, cafeteria, gym, um, and other spaces um, on a regular basis. And they really wanted to create that as a welcoming um, use for the for the community. This is just a view into the courtyard. So this learning courtyard um, has outdoor classroom spaces, um, has educational aspects. It has a, you know, um, a food production garden. It has bio swales. Um, it has breakout space for dining from the cafeteria. And again, this could be a space used um, by the community as well. Um, and it has the ability to be accessed from Cambridge Street, you can actually go through those glass connectors into the space and then all the way through to Donnelly Field. And that was a big piece of the project was opening back up the connection from Cambridge Street to Donnelly Field, um, which had been walled off with the previous um, school on the site. Just some images of the interior of the space. Um, we, of course, are trying to bring in um, as much daylight as we can. And we also wanted to make sure that we were connecting some of the net zero components um, to the learning, so it's a little bit hard to see in this particular angle, but um, there are sunshades on the exterior of the facade, and you can see those. So the little girl who's you know, sitting in the reading nook um, is actually looking out at a PV panel, and so she can see how that works and how it's connected into the building. Just some more images of the public library on the left-hand side and some of the classroom spaces. The enclosure of the building. Um, I like to talk about this uh, with people so they understand that this is pretty typical construction um, for commercial projects um, and it's nothing um, very unique to this building and that being in that zero building. Uh, the, you know, our values of the roof and walls are um, a bit above code, but it's pretty much what we would be doing on any commercial project. Um, again, even if it wasn't going for net zero and we just have double glazed um, insulated curtain wall systems. Um, we do play some games with the amount of glazing so that it feels um, like a very open and glassy space by being really selective of where we put large expanses of glasses. And then in other areas using um, a highly insulated spandrel panel um, to, um, again, have the appearance of glass but getting the ample daylight inside without over glazing the building. Some highlights of the mechanical Electrical and plumbing systems, um, you know, the main piece here is the ground source heat pump. Um, there's 190 geothermal wells that go down approximately 500 feet. Um, and I'll show you a plan of, you know, kind of where those are going in. And that's the main plant um, for heating and cooling. It supplies radiant, or sorry, it supplies water for radiant heating and cooling throughout the building. And then the main ventilation um, is a displacement ventilation system. And similar to what Jacob was talking about, the biggest efficiency piece we can do here is decoupling the heating and cooling from the ventilation. So we're doing it in a little bit different way um, because it is a, a different use type in this particular building than, than his project. But that is um, still the main piece there, there of having heating and cooling separate from the ventilation so you're not trying to um, uh, have those together and basically have to have those systems always operating even when you might not need um, one or the other. So uh, we also have heat recovery on the ventilation system. There's demand controlled ventilation um, throughout the building, typical things like LED lighting and daylighting controls. Um, we do have on-demand um, electrified hot water. Um, the only hot water that is connected to the radiant, or sorry, to the um, Ground source heat pumps is the kitchen. Um, so the kitchen hot water is supplied off of that and takes advantage of that. But for the um, individual lavatories and, and restrooms and things like that, it's a point of use um, system. And then as I mentioned earlier, earlier there is rainwater collection uh, for potable water um, reduction throughout the building. This is a little schematic that kind of shows you a typical classroom. Um, we have radiant heating and cooling and a panel on the ceiling at the exterior wall. Um, and then there's an exhaust 
uh, point closer into the corridor, and we have displacement ventilation, um, which display, which um, supplies the air low into the space, um, really in the occupied zone. It allows for um, a quieter system um, because the velocity is lower. It's more thermally comfortable and it provides better air quality um, to the occupants as the fresh air is supplied in the breathing zone and then stratifies and exhausts um, to the ceiling. So this is something that is, again, typical to um, a lot of the public school work that we're doing um, that is being done in the state. Um, and definitely adds to being able to meet net zero, um, but it is not a specifically specialized system for a net zero project. Um, and then again, the main source is the ground heat exchange. It supplies the heat pump chillers, and that's what's going to the radiant heating and cooling. Um, the schematic shows the air handler as if it's in the basement. The air handlers are actually on the roof, um, but otherwise it's what's going on. This is a plan just showing where those 190 geothermal wells are located. Uh, basically, wherever there isn't a building footprint, you pretty much have um, a well. Um, at the very northern part, the top of the plan there, um, there is a green space with no wells. That's the huge, um, over 100-year-old sycamore tree that we saved and um, designed the civic plaza around, so we don't have any wells near that particular tree, um, but other than that, we have wells throughout the, the site. And I just um, highlighted the blue rectangles here. Those are the vaults. So every um, area of wells will be collected in a vault. Um, and then that vault will then be piped um, directly into the building. Everything comes in this building where that big red arrow is in the middle. Um, but there are some vaults that will be spaced throughout that will collect um, areas of wells and bring those um, together and group them and then bring them into the building. So just to think about, and we'll talk about this hopefully more in the question and answer about, you know, how do you design your site? What goes in the ground? Um, you know, there's a huge 30,000 gallon um, rainwater collection tank and lots of other things going in the ground. There's a lot of stuff going on top of it, playground, basketball courts, um, splash pads, things like that. So there's a lot of coordination and design that needs to happen um, when you're looking at a geothermal system. We'll talk about that a little bit later, hopefully. And then just ending with um, the, you know, pieces that we're using for renewables. There are PV panels um, over the whole roof of the building. There is also PV on the facade, as I mentioned, through um, the sun shades, as well as some vertical facade mounted on the southern side. Um, and then we also have solar thermal panels um, over near the pool that are supplying um, hot water to warm the pool and extend the um, swimming season and then any excess water from that can also be used internally for domestic hot water. And I'll stop there. Great. Thanks, Kate. Um, really appreciate the cool presentation by all three of you. So, you know, we got a high level overview from Dennis that kind of, again, highlighted how important it is to have sort of vision and goals and got a deep dive in each of these projects uh, to see what works and what doesn't work. So just a reminder again, if you have questions, put them in the chat box. We have a couple that have come up already that I'll start with. Uh, and, and two of them are related specifically to the sort of wells and the capacity. One was kind of a technical question, uh, Kater Jacob, you might jump in on is, uh, well, actually, what's for BU? In drilling the 1,500 feet, like what kind of material did you come across and did you run into any issues in the kind of material that you had to dig through to make them three times deeper than they typically would be? Yeah, so the, the bedrock in this area is generally Cambridge argillite. It's a fractured rock, which um, you know, makes it somewhat more difficult uh, not because it's hard to drill through, but because it's because it's fractured, it can spall off into the borehole. So you have to um, line the borehole uh, with a steel casing down to a certain depth to help prevent that that uh, slight cave in from happening. In addition, the fracture also allows a lot of water from the ground to pour into the borehole. Uh, so you can imagine uh, as you're drilling deeper and deeper, and there's water in the borehole there's a huge amount of pressure of that water pushing down. And that 
that head that's actually doing the drilling is is both rotating but also hammering as it smashes through the rock basically and you're using a compressor up at the top to push the air down through the center of that pipe to, to create that percussion and that and that uh, progression through the rock and so your compressor is then fighting to push air at high pressure against all of that water that's stacked up on top of the the tip of the bore uh, the drill rig so the, the taller that amount of water is imagine 1500 feet of water pressure pushing down against you that makes progress slower so they have to use a booster compressor to add pressure to the drill rig to be able to um, make progress and so a lot of water ends up coming out of the ground and so it, that makes the progress a little bit slower and more challenging uh, but it's definitely feasible they actually Dennis do you want to talk at all about the the process of having three competitors sure uh, so we started out with uh, three three dr three drilling strategies uh, each with a different uh, company doing it um, they're all paid for for drilling one hole uh, we looked at the thermal capacity of each of those holes we uh, the one of the biggest concerns we had through the whole process was the amount of time it was going to take to do uh, the the well field and would that impact the overall construction schedule uh, so we wanted uh, fairly you know as accurate as we could in terms of verticality because you don't want these these wells are roughly 30 feet apart and uh, you don't want collisions uh, because if you have a collision then you're going to lose um, you'll lose the hole past the collision so you can still use the, t the upper part of that but um, so we had uh, sort of a competitive process with three different uh, operators and we chose the one that was the most successful to do the balance of the system. So there um, for bo both the BU and the Cambridge project. So there were questions. There are also another question about capacity that has actually come up in other discussions on geothermal. You know, is that what, what is the actual capacity and in an urban setting. Is there typically enough thermal mass under each building to do what a building would do or does if you put in 180 wells in Cambridge like you were talking about does that cannibalize the thermal resources of your next door neighbor if they wanted to do it how do you think about that sort of limit on capacity in an urban environment for for just the, the thermal uh, thermal load underneath so I would say that there's a spectrum of loads that a building can have um, if you have a new building that's designed to passive house standards, there's almost no load at all. And at that point, if you get that efficient, maybe you don't even need to do geothermal at all. You can just do air source. If you have <clears throat> a higher energy intensity building, higher occupancy, higher glazing ratio, so on, um, then geothermal makes sense, but you can keep your loads low enough if it's a new building or a deep energy retrofit kind of an application to keep the bore field small enough to make it work. Um, the the higher energy older buildings larger buildings so you take like the John Hancock for example that would be a big challenge because the loads are higher it's a less efficient building and it's you know so many floors that the density per square foot of site area would be very challenging um, although I, I know there are some cases where tall buildings are next to large open spaces which maybe that could make it work um, the other thing this brings up too is do you start to put in the boreholes under the streets? <laughs> Does the city then allow that or, or develop a public utility essentially that is uh, a bore field loop? And there is a group that's investigating that possibility. Um, and it may not be, the first installation may not be in downtown Boston, but they're looking at that option. Uh, so there's, I think there's different ways to, to slice it and you know, we'll see what the future holds. Kate, right, I would just on that? I was just going to add that you know buildings can have geothermal systems next to each other. Um, they aren't going to cancel each other out. Um, but as Jacob mentioned, we're not going to probably see every building be in geothermal because it's not even going to make sense for every building um, to do that. Um, but if you have a couple of new buildings going up next to each other and they both want to do geothermal, um, that's going to be possible. They're not going to cancel each other out. Um, and again. For us to get to you know zero carbon, it's about having the efficiency piece. Um, you know, 
it's just like we can't put enough solar panels for a really inefficient building on our roof, we also, you know, aren't going to put in 500 geothermal wells because we have a really inefficient building. Um, and I think, you know, the district-wide utility uh, piece is a very interesting conversation for urban areas. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure where that goes, but if you think about the amount of money going into potentially um, improving or um, fixing gas utilities, is it make sense to put something else in as a utility? And then, as Jacob mentioned, there's people who are looking at that um, from the district side. Yes, yeah, specific to the, um, uh, the the geo district issue, um, we have had some conversations with the heat organization. Most of you are probably familiar with the report they did with Borough Hapold and uh, Eversource now uh, has or is in the process of securing resources to do um, an actual geothermal district project. And when that's far enough along where they're sort of, they've got more sort of practical where they're at on implementation, we're going to try to do a GRCX event with heat on that. So stay tuned. I don't think it's quite yet at the stage where it's ready for that. Um, there's a question also in the chat box on, these are both institutional projects and sort of, so how did how did that make it easier to do? <clears throat> and are there, can you anticipate challenges that uh, if you didn't sort of have an institution behind this, if you had a private owner or something, that didn't have quite the same kind of commitment to climate outcomes at the front end. Could either of you speak to that? We're actually working with some developers right now on projects in Boston and Cambridge that are including geothermal. So they of course are, institutions also in a sense and they they do in, in many cases have long-term ownership and have very progressive goals overall for their for their companies so in some ways there's some similarities there i could imagine if there's a, a developer that was not going to hold the property that's just in to, to build it and then a few years later sell it um, that may not be the same thought process but with the goals of the city of boston and cambridge and seeing leaders like the city of Cambridge and Boston University, I think others are starting to realize it's actually not that big of a hurdle to incorporate some amount of geothermal. It may not handle the whole load, but it can shave off a huge amount of the fossil fuel consumption. And I would say that um, while we haven't seen, uh, if we look at straight um, payback, we haven't seen anything less than 15 years um, on a geothermal system, whether it's you know, whether the goals are really high in Cambridge where the addition of the geothermal was, you know, maybe 0.25% increase in cost or other projects that we're working on um, that are doing geothermal, they might see a, you know, a two to 4% increase in cost. Um, and the payback is roughly around 15 years on those um, ones that we're expecting to go net zero or be as efficient from the beginning. Um, and typically if a developer or somebody isn't going to own a property for 15 years that maybe um, isn't uh, as appetizing to them on some um, level, but I think that much more um, owners are saying, well, I'm building in Cambridge, I'm building in Boston, I'm building in you know, some other city outside of Massachusetts, and I know that my building, even if I sell it after five years, is going to be um, better valued if it's already set itself up to be carbon neutral um, because they see mandates coming down from localities or statewide. Um, and so they can look at that and make the financials work. Um, you know, and again, geothermal isn't for every building type, um, for multifamily. Um, we haven't seen that it makes sense. Air source heat pumps make much more sense for those type of projects, um, but for office buildings and other private um, you know, labs, things like that, we're seeing much more interest um, in going all electric and geothermal it can be a big component um, of certain building types. So there's been, you know, a discussion on sort of the design construction um, and the costs and challenges of that. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the operational side, both in terms of how the operating costs of these systems compare to a conventional system and then also are there any sort of operating challenges with running one of those geothermal uh, systems just in terms of continuous commissioning and other issues like that? Well, I think we're moving into an era where um, monitoring of building performance through the building automation system as part of its inherent uh, control logic, as well as 
you know, recommissioning and, and doing energy audits periodically on, on buildings is becoming more standard. You know, the Birdo and Budo and all of these things is, is pushing that and buildings are becoming more advanced and owners are becoming more savvy to the value of having a high performing building. So geothermal is just one more piece of that whole process. Um, it does, you know, it adds maybe a few pieces of equipment in terms of adding those heat pump chillers. Um, they're pretty standard products in the grand scheme of a building. It's not a huge shift in terms of the maintenance protocol. Um, the bore field itself is basically zero maintenance. Um, we're always doing closed loop systems that just sit there for the life of the building. And um, unless you actively damage them with a backhoe, probably you're not gonna have any problems. Um, the controls uh, you know, is the one piece that we're particularly sensitive to, setting that up properly from the beginning, commissioning it properly from the beginning, and having um, you know, intuitive adjustable uh, controls for just some of the key variables so that you can over time make sure that the system is staying balanced as intended. And so you may wanna have a third party have a review every couple of years just to make sure things are on track. Um, but it's such a slow process, you know, that the temperature fluctuations in that amount of mass in the ground is such a slow process that you can schedule that at your convenience and, and it's a pretty, mi you know, minor effort. Great. Kate, anything on the operation, operation side you want to throw in? Um, yeah, I would say that it's, uh, the only difficulty is it might be a new system, right? So the staff um, is just learning a new system, um, but we haven't seen um, really anything, like as Jacob mentioned, it's part of the BAS system. Um, people are kind of moving to that technology anyways, the building management. So um, once they're learning sort of this new system, this is a, maybe a different piece of equipment. Um, you know, it doesn't have additional costs in terms of, um, you know, materials like there aren't, you know, a lot more filters or anything like that where there's a cost uh, difference, um, doesn't cost anymore. Um, it's more of a knowledge of the facilities management team um, to learn a system that might be new from maybe the gas boiler that they've been doing in a you know, existing building. Uh, there's a, another technical question from Joe LaRusso. Is, to, is, is there a general rule of thumb between the size of a building and the number of wells you need to need to drill. I mean, clearly it's going to be related to how deep they are and what your EUI in the building is, but is there a, you know, given, given a moderately efficient building as a rule of thumb, he's looking at a 50,000 square foot building. So we've done a couple of 50,000 square foot buildings. Um, actually a couple of them are in the pictures behind me. Um, and we are typically in the range of uh, 20 to 30 boreholes, 500 feet deep. But those are for, you know, classroom buildings or lab buildings, so they're more intense. Um, you can get a 50,000 square foot office building down to the point where it probably makes sense just to do air source or the bore field would be, you know, maybe 10 boreholes at 500 feet each. So it really depends on how low you can drive those loads, the program of the building and your interest in, uh, you know, do you want the, the extreme, you know, long long life system of the of the geothermal system you really want that interior uh, maintenance so that there's nothing outside or do you want to go with a less expensive option and put in air source heat pumps um, rather than you have components that are outside that need maintenance outdoors so i think that's a, a you know process that the team would need to evaluate but you can definitely drive the the demand down for a 50,000 square foot building to a very low point with the technology that's available today and related to that, Jacob, given given how the technology on air source heat pumps is um, is moving, do you anticipate a point in time where people wouldn't do geothermal anymore because the air source heat pumps are so efficient? I think at some point in the future, um, for new buildings, people will not be considering geothermal because the air source technology is advancing so quickly. The capacity of those systems is increasing. The efficiency is increasing. Um, we may want to reserve that site area for, you know, backfeeding old buildings where it's more difficult in some cases to get the loads down as low uh, to, to use that geothermal resource. But again, it's a very, in a lot of ways, it's still a very personal decision for the institution or the, or the client about how they want to run the building. Do they want to have to go outside to maintain any equipment or is it worth it to them to have that everything indoors? Um, two questions related. Yeah, so just to mention so that, that yeah, um, 
In terms of sizing, there isn't a relation to the size of your building and the number of wells. As Jacob mentioned, you need to know what the usage is, um, meaning hours you're operating it, and what type of um, program is in there. Um, and then we make some assumptions about the capacity, um, but what really is important is doing test wells. Um, we call them test wells, but we design them to be permanently part of the system um, to really understand what the capacity is at your particular site. So early on in design, we will make some assumptions about what the capacity might be, um, but we need to do a test well to get um, a more accurate reading um, of your particular ground and your site, and then um, you know, we can work through the building loads and eventually get to you know exactly how many wells you need um, so we can do estimates early on and but they're really being revised throughout the design process um, once we know the true capacity of your particular site yeah, i think the other important thing to note is that the if a building is designed correctly the uh, the heating load is going to be much lower than the cooling load and so Given that geothermal's focus is eliminating fossil fuel consumption, you want to size the geothermal system for your heating load. And so you want a supplemental system typically to provide that peak cooling that's higher than your peak heating demand. So we always are, are recommending a, a hybrid system where the geothermal focuses on getting the heating taken care of, it does some of the cooling, and then you supplement the cooling with another conventional cooling system so that um, you're not overspending on the bore field. Great, thanks. Yeah, I think that will vary based on the, the project type and use. Um, just we haven't seen that in K-12, um, so I think it's probably, it, it, is, it is definitely different in terms of how your building is used um, and operated throughout the year. To, to Kate's point earlier, um, for the Center for Computing and Data Sciences, the first well, first three wells we did were test wells where we did the thermal analysis to fine tune the, the engineering for the building. We also have a, another building that's 95,000 square feet, uh, which has six 1,500 foot deep wells. So to your original question, that, that worked out uh, at that rate. And, and as far as maintenance is concerned, there really haven't been any issues there that are any different than a normal building would have. Uh, two questions related to resilience and uh, sort of are these systems any more or less resilient to natural disasters uh, than a conventional system? And then the second related question is what in each of these projects is your backup strategy if there's a blackout? So at, at King Open, they, um, we looked at battery storage, but it just didn't make sense for how they were using that building. Um, so there is a biodiesel generator on site, um, which is just for really freeze protection um, and emergency egress in that building. So it's a fairly small generator. We do have another project that's doing geothermal that has on-site battery storage as their backup. Dennis? Um, and, and then in terms of resilience, I think there was a question about, you know, do the, is the well field itself impacted um, by, you know, I don't know, flooding or things like that. No, um, flooding is not an issue. Um, high groundwater is not an issue for these wells. It makes it a little more difficult to put them in, but once they're in, um, you know, there isn't any particular um, disaster um, that, you know, affects the well field at all. Uh, I would agree with that uh, for BU as well. Uh, there, there, Sorry for some background noise here. I'm going to be oh. quiet for a bit. Okay. Uh, yeah, we so have we have generators that'll produce enough power to run the electric boilers to maintain minimum heat for view data sciences, uh, yep. so that it won't it won't freeze if it's a winter you know zero degree day. Uh, there was a very specific question related to the Massachusetts Transportation Building and its approach to geothermal. Apparently, it uses uh, stored water in the basement as opposed to geothermal wells. Do any of you are any of you familiar with that technology and how it compares to these projects? Yeah. So the the thermal capacity of a of a storage tank is dramatically lower than what you can store in the ground. So this the, typically when you're talking about thermal storage, you're talking about hours or days of storage, whereas the ground is a full year essentially. Um, so uh, my understanding of that building is that the, the marketing is maybe a little bit 
uh, overblown in terms of how it's really operating. I've heard that it's also connected to a steam line for heating. So I'd be curious to get more details. I didn't work on that job. It's a, it's a very old building at this point, but I'd be curious to get more details to really understand how is it running? Is it truly running without any steam use? That, that I think would be a little bit surprising. Great, thanks. Um, question from Paul Lipke on, uh, can you talk a little bit more about whether there are any issues with the chilled beam strategy, including condensation from the, from the beams, or is that technology mature enough now where it's hassle-free? We've designed millions of square feet of buildings with chilled beams, including healthcare, including buildings in Florida. Um, we have had no issues with condensation. You, the main thing is to make sure you're dehumidifying the air properly at the air handlers and that you're only doing sensible cooling at the zone. We, one of the best strategies to do that is what we've done on BU Data Sciences, which is to use two enthalpy wheels in the air handlers and the second wheel in series uh, does uh, added dehumidification. And so you get nice dry air uh, that will avoid any condensation issues. Thanks. Um, so that's the end of the questions that are in the chat box. I think it would be great if, if we could just sum up and you know, Kate, you and Jacob and Dennis, just say a few words about sort of at a high level if somebody else was imagining doing uh, a geothermal project from the beginning. Like, uh, you know, what are the biggest challenges you need to sort of prep for and think about at the front end? And, and, and what's the most effective way to present the opportunity to uh, the building? advice on that and then we'll wrap it up. Dennis, do you want to start? Sure, I'll be happy to. Um, so from our perspective, uh, the biggest concern I think I did mention is schedule. And initially we were expecting 1500 foot well to take two weeks to do. And if you add that up times, you know, however many you're gonna have, it's a, it, it impacts the schedule significantly. Um, so, and it turned out to be a lot less than that. Jacob, you could, you, when you chat, you maybe can, can, uh, give us the average, but, um, that was a big concern. Noise was a concern. Um, you know, these are, this process isn't, I mean, for our campus up against, uh, you know, right in the middle of, of, a housing part of campus. Um, we were concerned about students and students were concerned about the noise. Uh, so were faculty in some areas, but uh frankly the noise from drilling these wells is less than if you're doing pile driving um so that's you know it's construction and it's in an urban setting so it's part of what you have to live with but you have to understand what those are um and i think the other thing is is uh, as kate mentioned understanding the you know by testing uh understanding what the thermal capacity of each well will be and do you have uh, the right people doing the wells? I mean, that's why we went to three different uh, companies to find one that would would uh, be successful for us. Uh, and the co collisions of the wells was another concern. We didn't have any collisions, but um, you know that would just mean we'd have to do another well. Um, but it, from a cost perspective, I feel like, uh, particularly for larger buildings where you are really having an impact on the amount of square footage you need for mechanical systems diminished because you're going to geothermal and efficient systems. Jacob can add a little more to that. Um, you know, I think the economics are pretty good, are very good. Um, the, we're redoing some financial analysis to better understand what those are now that we have 100% uh, construction documents uh, and we're underway. So uh, as we have better information, we'll, we'll share that. Jacob, anything else you want to add? Yeah, I think to me that the biggest driver here in terms of cost is the integrated design. You know, you, you can always find opportunities that will reduce cost and you can always find things that add cost. Typically geothermal is, is one of the biggest added costs in achieving net zero with a, a geothermal design because the drilling the boreholes is expensive. But the key is to, to with your team, 
sit down and figure out, well, how do we really optimize the building as a whole? How do we find opportunities to reduce loads and make systems smaller and save space and avoid driving up floor to floor heights and all these other issues so that you can then recoup enough funds overall to cover some of those premiums. And so that, you know, overall the, the net premium we've been able to achieve on, on every single net zero building we've done, which is now uh, approaching 2 million square feet is less than 1% construction cost premium consistently through that integrated approach. That's great, thanks. Kate, you get the last word. Um, so I would say the integrated design from a little bit of a different perspective, obviously it'll get you to the efficiency and the right design, um, but it's about having the right players at the project uh, from the beginning. You don't need to commit to geothermal at the beginning, but just doing the feasibility analysis, you need to make sure that you have a geothermal design consultant. In our experience, that's someone separate from the mechanical engineer. Um, so you need to make sure that you know, your mechanical engineer as well as your energy modeler, if that's a separate entity, that all three of those entities are really working together um, in an integrated way to understand um, you know, early on what the implications would be from a geothermal system. Um, so that then if you decide that that is probably a system that you'll go forward with, that then you commit to doing the test wells. Um, and again, schedule is important because um, it can take a long time. You know, King opened that particular project having almost 200 wells. Uh, you know, we had an early package so that they could start the wells as soon as the existing building was demolished. Um, and it took almost a year to drill all those wells. So um, that's sort of the extreme side of that many wells. You know, we don't typically see that many. Um, again, this building, we started working on 2014. So I think even with today's technology, we might have looked at something different to reduce those number of wells if we were designing it starting today. Um, but there's still a schedule piece there. Um, so it's about getting the right consultants um, on board early and then understanding what the impact of schedule is through the design as well as the construction um, phase is really critical. Great, thank you. Well, um, thank you, Dennis, uh, Jacob, and Kate uh, for your just totally cool and fascinating presentations. Uh, and, and, and thank both you your institutions for doing these projects that just really totally demonstrate the art of the possible, <laughs> make it pretty clear that it's totally possible to do these buildings uh, uh, in a cost effective, uh, effective manner. So I think it, it, it encourages us to continue to be more aggressive. And thanks to everybody for joining us. Uh, you will be getting an email with links to the presentations and also to the video, and you'll soon be getting an invite to our September 16th uh, GRCX uh, resilience uh, event. So um, with that, you get 10 minutes out of your schedule back into your life today and really appreciate your taking the time and joining us. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, John. Thank you.